the cloud. All right. Thank you. So thank you for being here. So this is the first in a series of three uh, um, workshops to help you run your business better or your life better. Uh, so Jim has a lot of experience and um, working to help teams be more effective, uh, to your personal life, your marriages, your family, um, which is maybe why you married who you married <laughs> or how, why you entered the help. field having married who, whom you married. <laughs> Uh, so the series is called Finding Your Modus, um, and I, I kind of, so there'll be three of them, and I'll, um, so there's executing, and I think of that as, okay, choosing the vehicle that you're going to drive in order mm -hmm. to go down this path that you're going to do, and then see the road, and, you know, we all know, we all, I use uh, Google Maps, thank goodness for Google Maps, but the roads that you are all going down do not have Google Maps for it. You don't know where <laughs> you're going, right? Nobody knows where you're going. That's part of what's exciting about it, part of what's scary about it. So next week, that uh, Jim will talk more about how to see where that where that road is and how to follow it down. And then the third one, so in three, two, uh, two weeks, off by one error, um, it, it talks about pivoting. And so that's when you need to go off of the road you're on to find something else. And a lot of us uh, discovered that during COVID, uh, but it's really important. And it's also sometimes that is exactly the road you need to be on. So talking about the, your path and how to be more effective about it. And I, I got the I got his book. So Jim has written a lot of books. Um, <laughs> the one I'm I'm holding up, which you can't see. Oh, oh you got oh, it almost. Almost, almost personal conduct. That's me and Tony Ann. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and also Tony Ann, uh, the two of them wrote it together. And then he's got his more recent book, I think, uh, on the monitor there. And <laughs> I've, I've read the more recent book. So, uh, but this, these are all books about how to uh, do these things that we've been talking about to find the most effective vehicle for what you're doing to find the road and to know when to change your roads. So I, I liked what I looked up his uh, LinkedIn and it said he will help you collaborate with confidence, which I thought was a great thing to say. I need to update my LinkedIn <laughs> and uh, how to improve your effectiveness so that you're not exhausted all the time. And sometimes you can just be more effective without having to take more time. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Jim, and thank you very much for being here today. Thank, thank you. All right, so I will give us a screen to focus on as, as well as me. Uh, uh, so this is the third of a, or the first of a three-part series, and our goal here is to find ways to visualize our work and our team's work such that everyone knows what to do and when to do it. Uh, and uh, as, as Martha mentioned, to, to act with confidence. And I'll tell a little story about acting with confidence in a little bit, but um, I, I have found that when you have a group of people who want to get together and do something, they start off very collaboratively because everybody knows what everybody else knows <laughs> and you're, you're kind of all marching in the same direction. Then people start to get more and more individual tasks. They start to go off in their own directions. And the next thing you know, the group is fragmented. Uh, they have to have meetings to get alignment and you spend an amazing amount of your time, overhead and en energy just trying to get back to where you were at the beginning. So what we would like to do is set up systems up front that show people these are the decisions we've made. This is the work we have to do. These are the options on our plate. These are the things that are all going to allow us to be successful. And then each person can act at the right time and do the right things because you have a narrative that has been spelled out for you. And uh, we call that narrative overall something called the right environment. And a right environment is where all of the people on your team have what they need to do a good job. So we're all Seattle people. Uh, when I first moved to Seattle, it was to build the light rail system. Now, a very, very long time ago, <laughs> 
And I did two things at that point. One is I worked for a company called David Evans and Associates. And uh, David Evans and Associates, we had a mo their motto was we find outstanding professionals and give them the tools they need to do an outstanding job. And they meant it. And so we, no matter who we were, even when the company got big, we all knew what was going on. We knew the finances of the company. We knew all the contracts that were active. We had 35 offices when I left the company. And I still knew, I knew in, in Alabama, I knew what projects we were working on, right? And then the second thing I did there, uh, did during that time from 1990 to 1999, uh, which is which was about four years longer than I should have been doing it, was I was the Northwest Regional Co-Chair for this thing, for the Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt. So I was a AIDS activist in a particularly successful venture that was all about visualization. So at that point, you know, when it was like called the gay plague, it was very hard to have a conversation about AIDS, but then the quilt comes along and all of a sudden it's a piece of fabric. It's an art piece. It's a memorial. It's, it's humanized. And then we were able to take that into Mormon temples and like, uh, like to the Teamsters and to places that previously before wouldn't take it because the message was visual and the message was understandable and it was depoliticized. So we want to do the same thing with work. And so let's talk a little bit about that. So, bing, um, we want desperately <laughs> to be able to get control of the work that we have as a group. Uh, it's, it's kind of the human condition. All we wanna do is like find a way to just calm the noise, right? So uh, we'll talk a little bit about personal Kanban in a second, which is like the first mechanism that we're going to talk about in these three calls to do this. There are other mechanisms. So just because Tony Ann and I wrote a book, you know, 15 years ago called Personal Kanban doesn't mean this is a personal Kanban class. This is actually a uh, much, much wider than that. But ultimately what happens is when we go off and plan for things and I'm a civil engineer, but I'm also an AICP, American Institute of Certified Planners, which means like I can plan the city of Seattle or Portland or things like that. Um, planning doesn't work. <laughs> so I'm going to start right there that the thing that I trained for years to do fundamentally doesn't work because human beings look at the plan and they think it's a forecast. They think it's a future actual, right? So what happens is we plan and we fool ourselves by planning and thinking that things are going to be easy and that they're gonna follow the plan. And then when they don't, something's wrong with the people because they didn't conform with the plan. When in reality, the plan just didn't match what, what life actually wanted you to do <laughs> or demanded that you do. So like no one, no one planned for the Nisqually earthquake, <laughs> but it happened. <laughs> and then we had to do something with it. So we wanna make plans for the easy stuff. We want to have some system in place to manage complicated things. And then we want to have a strong strategy for de to deal with the complex. So it's not enough to go all lean startup and just say, oh, we're going to pivot or we're going to experiment, you know, ooh, hand wavy, send Eric Reese your money. Uh, don't, don't do that. <laughs> but do get together with your team and say, OK, when we have a plan and things are going well, how do we communicate with each other? When we have a plan and somebody notices that something might change or that there's an opportunity, how do we communicate with each other? And when something explodes, how do we communicate with each other? And how do we do it in a way that preserves the excitement of being a startup? It doesn't become an existential threat, right? <laughs> so Mar let's pop Jim, Jim, Martha's oh, hands is up. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, Jim. Martha. Could you take a minute and talk about the difference between complicated and complex? Oh, dear. <laughs> I, Two this, minutes? Is the point, this is the point where I tried to decide whether I whether I love or hate Martha. Um, <laughs> we, 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 I'm, uh, I'm, if, if this is going to mess up your presentation. It's, it's not going to mess up my presentation. I'm just going to I'm hoping against all hope and I do not. OK, so here I'm going to do this instead. Please, please hold for Google. Image. Yeah. Can Evan. 
Uh, all right. So thank God for Google. Um, no, 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 oh, no, 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 no. But not thank God for the way the internet's constructed. Um, how do I do this? Like this. This is what exactly what I was thinking. Excellent. Okay. A real good right. reference to, to go Excellent. to. Right. All right. So um, uh, there are many complexity novel models out there. This one, uh, which I'm trying my damnedest to make big, um, open open image in new tab. There we go. Um, this is the Kinevin framework, and it is actually very important to understand. Um, just kind of its own its own little rabbit hole. But why this is important is this: there are different fundamental frameworks that you apply to work based on its complexity. And so this model goes kind of counterclockwise. Think of it as a as a um, as a increasing arc of complexity going counterclockwise from very clear all the way around to very chaotic. And so you start off in the clear zone and this is where things where work is obvious, where there's a cause and an effect. So if I if a light bulb goes out in my house, I know how to how, no, I know how to re replace it. I know how to replace it if I'm here or if I'm in Cape Town or if I'm in the Philippines. I know how to replace a light bulb because that's clear. If the light bulb goes out and I say, "Hey, random other person, replace the light bulb," I don't have to give them any indication of how to do it. They can just go do it. This is really, this is the work that you would give to other people on Fiverr <laughs> uh, and not have to explain anything at all. When you get up into complicated, this is where things become a little bit more uh, interesting and it's where we live most of our lives. So in the complicated domain, uh, we engage expertise. And so all of us are experts in something or budding experts in something. So Sherry has now become an expert both in the use of, of hard plastics and soft plastics in dishwashers, <laughs> which is a very esoteric thing to be an expert about. <laughs> uh, uh, Dan is now an expert on, on how to actually schedule and run airplanes through airports through with arbitrary flight plans. And Noel is now an expert in the application of, of LLMs in the actual um, uh, interpretation of people's life's events, okay? None of you three have, have the same expertise at all. <laughs> and we could not fund, you, you're not, you are not fungible. <laughs> if we were making the plastic harness to wash people's memories and then fly them to, to Europe, <laughs> then you would be different parts of the same company, but you're not fungible. And so when you get into the complicated area, you start to rely on specific individuals and their talents, and most importantly, their memories of things that they've done with you before. So when we plan work, and this is a big thing here, when we plan work, our brains fool us into thinking that almost all of the work lives around here, like, like somewhat clear to somewhat complicated. And then we don't plan for very complicated things or weird. And then when those complicated or weird things happen, we we blame other people. Okay. So when we get into things and we're scheduled or when other people corner us and say, what's your delivery date going to be for this? We will routinely harm ourselves by oversimplifying the work that we need to do. And I've done everything from barbecue meat to build uh, entire subway systems. In every single situation, I've seen this at play. Complex, when we get to that third part that I talked about, this is where you don't actually know what's going on and you have to run those experiments to, to find out what's going on. The single biggest sin here that people commit is that they will put too small of a team or worse yet an individual on the investigation of that complex object. Complexity doesn't work that way. So any complex system needs to be solved with multiple perspectives. 
So this is why this is why we have diversity in our workplace. We want to have multiple people show up who have multiple backgrounds and multiple experiences so that when they come and look at your complex problem or their complex problem, that they're instantly running different internal algorithms against that problem, right? So they've had different life experiences that make them see those problems in different and unique ways. And when you combine all of those people together, you get a, pro a collaborative problem solving group. I love this stuff. <laughs> and that group is what will make it successful. But if you have one person just going against it, it's the same thing as if you have a, a file and it's encrypted and you're trying to break that encryption by just sitting there and typing codes nonstop. So when back here, when I say that, um, uh, that, uh, that, that work can be, uh, oh, that's why it looks weird. Uh, let's make that the right size again. Uh, when I say that we want to, we want to just plan for the easy or maybe the slightly complicated, that's what I'm talking about, is those things that you have a high degree, like a very high degree of certainty that you're going to be able to be good at predicting the outcome of that, that, that can be a plan. Uh, the complicated part needs to have wiggle room. So that's where we have your buffers. Say this is going to take three to six weeks rather than just three weeks. So we have to we have to watch out for wishful thinking here. We have to watch out for confirmation bias here. We have to watch out for sunk cost fallacy here because those are the things that will drive us to underestimate the amount of time that these complicated things will hap have happen. We also have to be willing as a group when something compl complex comes up to have the organizational fortitude to take our people and commit them to solving that problem. And I even almost said the wrong thing there. So everyone in the world is going to see that as taking people offline to fix this problem. But what this is, is this is the actual work. This is doing stuff. This is the actual work. The actual work is figuring out why does that plastic melt when this plastic doesn't? Uh, why do these things melt uh, on the lower rack, but they don't melt on the, on the middle rack? <laughs> um, you know, why, why, why is this categorizing these people's memories as something completely lewd and lascivious when they're obviously not? <laughs> um, I, that, um, that when those things come up, that's the reason that we have a startup. The startup is to actually solve the complexities around new and interesting ideas. It is not to build a commoditized object, right? So, so Sherry's major dilemma here is time to market and ability to sell this as quickly as possible because it is a cage and it can be recreated by almost anybody with a 3D printer. So how quickly can she get that to market and what problems can she solve that other people will have to take that same time to solve? The faster she solves them, the faster she gets to market and the longer those other people won't because she's the one with a solution. Uh, Sherry. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Are you saying, I, I have a bunch of questions, but are you <laughs> saying to strategize for the complex? So are you saying um, to have your, your team strategize for for the complex uh, questions that might be presented on yeah. your product, is that what you're saying? Yeah, or is or it... what you discover as you go along. Yeah. Uh, so so you've you've got let's say that that your thing works perfectly fine. You've tested it a hundred thousand times, and then all of a sudden one day it starts melting. Right. Right. Why? 
Mm-hmm. What, you know, that's totally unforeseen. How did, how did that happen? We've, we've, we've done thousands of hours of testing in many, many different products with de- mm-hmm. many different water types. Why is it suddenly starting to melt? Okay. Um, why, uh, or we've got it uh, set up. Everything's perfect, perfectly fine. There's no, there's no leaching of anything in it at all. And then all of a sudden, the state of California comes out with a new regulation that regulates certain types of plastics, and and your type of plastic is on it, even though you don't agree with the with it being on it. What do you what do you do then? Right, right. Um, and okay. so under here, what what I what I colored green, standard work for weird, is that what tends to happen is the larger your group gets, the more unlikely people are to point those out when they happen. And then you sit on them longer and longer and longer until it becomes more and more expensive to solve the problem because you've overinvested in an old product that might be outdated or something else. So what, what the group needs is an understanding that when anyone on the team notices that there is a deviation either from plan or from uh, the market or from something that will either benefit or disbenefit the 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 end result that there is the ability of someone to stop all production and to say we have to deal with this and that that person isn't chastised mm-hmm. for that but that they are lauded for that and that no one feels like it's a uh, i mean it might be inconvenient <laughs> but 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 no one but no one's saying you know oh i wish this would never happen because that's just what happens in business weird happens in business and so you have to figure out how to work for that it's a you know like right now a big problem in a lot of brick and mortar businesses is people with stolen kias drive their kias through the front of the business <laughs> to load all their stuff up into trucks and drive away. And then they put bollards up and they they drive around the bollards or they, you know, find a way to launch the Kia into the top of the business. Um, so that they will, you know, go around your fixes and your weird. And, you know, those bollards are an experiment. So the the goal here is to make sure that when one of those types of work from the Kinevan framework show up, that you're prepared to handle that work type and um, if if I may, <laughs> I'll try and re-steer this back into to what I what, to to where to where we're going initially is that is that you can't do this if you can't see your work. All right. So if if your work is completely blind, you know if it if it if it looks like that, nobody can manage that because. It's invisible. You can't have a conversation around it because it has no structure. So you want to give your work some structure. So here comes one. <laughs> so this is a personal Kanban. Uh, it's a quick and quick and easy uh, personal Kanban. And um, this is what happens to most people when we first get together with them and we say, can you write down everything that you're doing? And they'll say, sure, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and I'm doing that thing. Oh, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and oh my God, I'm doing this, and I am not done with this yet, and I don't want to do this, but I'm doing it, and I don't want to do this. And then after a while, you get this ridiculous number of things that are in flight. And so what's happening there is we are running afoul of something that is called the Zygarnik effect. And the Zygarnik effect tells us that um, when we have a a task and it's in flight, we're thinking about it. And then if we stop it and go to work on something else, we keep thinking about it. So the more things that we have that we're actively doing, the more things our brains are actively remembering all of the state information for that task. How far am I? What have I learned? Who am I doing it with? When's it due? Who's going to be mad when it's done? All those types of things. And that uses up your brain's capacity. So the more things you have in flight, the more slowly things get done. And the worse things get done because you'll work on these things kind of randomly for a while and somebody will come and yell at you and say, where the hell's my thing? And then you'll finish this as quickly as possible to get it off your plate, right? 
So uh, that is a problem. It is a huge, huge problem. So what we want to do is say, oh, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to do is I'm going to limit my work in progress because I've visualized my work now and I can see physically how painful that amount of work is. So I'm going to just limit myself to these things. And then I'm going to hold off on, on this other stuff. Can I do that? Oh, I can. That's lucky. <laughs> Always nice when the tech works. So, uh, so now, uh, rather than having a ton of stuff, we can now focus on something and finish it, focus on something and finish it, pull some new things in, focus on them and finish. But because we're focusing, we can focus and we can finish it with quality because there's just a few things. We have a pretty good idea of what the narrative is around this. Why is it there? Who am I working with? Blah, 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 blah. So we can finish it with confidence. Yay. So now, previously, I should say, previously when there was just a ton of stuff here, you know, you had 10 million things in there and somebody said, can you do this other thing? You're like, sure, why not? I'm already doing more than I can handle. Another thing doesn't matter. You know, camel's back's already broken. Just squash that puppy. <laughs> uh, but now there's a rule that says, hey, we now have an economy and there's three things that can be in this economy. So now when you're done with this and you look over and you say, what do I want to do next? Whatever you pull over to do next is now one third of everything that you could be doing. And all of a sudden that has value. And that's why this is an economy. And that's why these are options. So these are actually, this isn't just like an accident, ac academic or a, a convenience option. Like, oh, I'd like to do that. This is like actually a fiscal option. So all of these things have strike dates. All of these things have expiration dates. All of these things have a point where it's too early to start them or too late to start them. So now we know and we can see these things about that and we can look at this and say, OK, this is the most important thing for me to be doing next. And I pull it in. And when your team is doing that, which might look something like this, which is our board right now for Modus Institute, you can see we've got multiple people there doing stuff. We've got multiple projects in flight. And we've got multiple tasks that are either in flight or waiting to be done or back here in the hopper to be done later. Pretty cool. It, <laughs> and I will tell you, because this is important to say, that, that you are all human. So if that's your takeaway for today. <laughs> So Sherry, when you go off and, and report back what you got out of today, <laughs> we are all human. And so what's important about that isn't just that we walk around and and uh, and that, uh, you know, uh, we, we like to go out to eat from time to time, but that human beings get on wagons and they fall off wagons. And sometimes you fall off a wagon and you can fall into some, you know, it's not just falling on the hard ground. You can fall into some pretty comfortable straw and not notice for a few days that you've fallen off the wagon. So what will happen to me, Jim Benson, inventor of personal Kanban and therefore completely flawless and all things managing his work, is that I will frequently find that like Tony Ann will be asking me something in a meeting and I will snap at her like nobody's business. And it's an indication for me that I've taken on too much work and I've not put it on the board and I don't see it and it's stressing me out. And then I will sheepishly go away i will visualize my work <laughs> and and it's it is incredible how quickly that is a an analgesic it's a salve to uh to to freaking out about these things so let's move a bunch of this stuff over and we'll go in the other direction so let's say that this is the board for employee number seven of your company and they're working away. In the before times when you had no visualization, you would walk over to their desk or call them up on Slack or Zoom or whatever. And you'd say, hey, can you do this? And they will say, yes, <laughs> because no matter how lovable you are, 
you have positional power. You are their boss and they want to help. And what you're asking them to do is either necessary or interesting. And that will make them say yes, and that will make them pull in too much work, and then they will be doing too much work, and you will have no idea because you can't see what's going on inside their heads. Sorry. <laughs> but if you go over, and let's just make this like the, the new task. This, new, this black task is a new task, and you're bringing that over, and you come walking in, and you're like, hey, I have this new task, and oh, I see you're working on these three things. Well, that's okay. You know, this is important, so just get to it next. Or you can say, you know what? This is like really, 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 really important. Can I, can I ask you to break your whip limit? You know, because we both know that this is really important. Okay. And I'm saying this because that's a real thing. Okay. It, it, we're not living in some fantasy world where people can only do three things at a time. But what we do want to know is that when something becomes four and our Sesame Street brain wants to rebel against four being greater than three, uh, that we know why the four is there. And we also know that we want to get this done probably collaboratively, and we wanted to get it done quickly so that we can rectify the problem and go back to three. May I just add something, Jim, real quick? Certainly. Likewise, this is a way, I mean, it would be lovely is if every day all we had to do was planned work, but you all are creating something that doesn't exist. So there is going to be a huge amount of unplanned work in the course of your day. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to be able to start understanding what your capacity is, start being able to understand how much planned work you get done in a day and how much emergent work you get done in a day. And you could start analyzing out of the emergent work that is showing up, how much of it is necessary, is making your product better, mm -hmm. is making your day better, is, is work that you enjoy doing, and how much of it is annoyances that shouldn't be surfacing. And so because you're actually visualizing these tasks now, you could find a way to get rid of them going forward. Right. Absolutely. So understanding our capacity doesn't mean that we understand the mathematical value of your capacity. <laughs> like my capacity is officially 11 parcels of oomph. Uh, but what it is, is understanding that, that there are proxies for that, which is like each one of these things is a set of relationships. Uh, it's a set of things that need to be done. It's a set of uh, taxing things on our brains. And so we could end up that we get in after a while and we change that three to a four or that we have different types of work. Like we have great big tasks and little tasks. So we might have two little tasks and one great big task that we could be doing at a time, uh, you know, wh whatever those might be. Um, but the other thing now is like, let's say I come in and I say, okay, we, you can do this or you can wait. So now we've set something up in priority. And that implies that these things didn't have a priority. So I do really quickly want to show another thingy here. And this is called a priority filter. So each of these are different sized blocks. And not surprisingly, a certain number of post-it notes fits in each block. So we have priority one that can only have three post-its in, then up here can have six and priority three can have, you know, a ton. And the goal here isn't to stack rank these things. It's just basically to have an understanding in the grand scheme of things, how important are these things? And then when I finish a task, when I look over, I can look over and I can say, okay, this is high priority and I know it can get done. So I'll pull it in, I'll do it, I get it done. And then I move on, right? Moving it over so it's done. If if I look over here and I say, okay, these are high priority, but this one involves Tony Ann and she's gonna be out of the office for the day. And this one is gonna be using our CRM, but they're about to do a major re new release of our CRM in a week. So it'd be silly for me to go in and do a bunch of work on the CRM when they're going to change the feature set. You might hold off on these, even though they're super high priority, and pull something that you know you can get done down here. So the importance about this is that people are now making informed decisions. 
And what frequently happens in a prioritization scheme is people will just stack rank stuff and then they will just dumbly do them one, two, three, and four, whether or not situationally it's the right time to do them. So right? like if you have a ticket on your board, so I use this to organize my life. If you have a ticket on your board that says, buy mom a Christmas gift and it's January 7th, people will normally still feel in organizations that we work with, I still have to pull that ticket. It's a mm -hmm. mandate. And so what we want you to do is we want you to scrutinize every time you pull something into doing, is that ticket still a value? Because arguably tickets have expiration dates and your context is always changing. Your context is always going to dictate that. That's why when we wrote the book, that first column was to do. And then we realized to do, you know, language begets behavior to do removes people's responsibility for actually seeing if that ticket is still a value. That's what we if changed. If it really does that. need to be done. Yeah. So that's why we changed that first column is, is your options. Mm -hmm. Is this still a viable option? Does anybody have any questions? Um, Noel is having trouble seeing your screen. Does everybody, so Dan and Sherry, are you seeing? Oh, so you're having trouble like reading the individual. You don't have to worry though? about what's on the cards. Yeah. Um, are, so are you seeing his screen at all? Yeah, I'm seeing it all. Are, are you, no, you're not seeing it at all. No, okay. I, so, so no, I, um, I, I, what's it called? Zoom should have two screens open for you. So if you go down to the tray and click Zoom, there should be two screens up there, one with my screen and one with all the people. And you're probably looking at all the people. Yeah, so yeah, so let's see another um hmm. okay. Anyway, we'll um uh, we'll keep working on it. Go ahead and continue. All right. Mm -hmm. Um so uh um yes. So next, uh and this is really interesting because this is totally not the format that I thought we were gonna go with, but I'm enjoying it. So <laughs> Uh, when you have, uh, just like we have been doing, but when anybody has any questions or anything that, you know, even if you just want to talk about these things in your context, just raise your hand and we'll go. Feel free to, uh, to derail me because we've got, uh, we've got over an hour. Uh, so uh, really quickly, I want to go back to, actually, I don't, I want to go back to this again. Um, I want to show these things live. Can I just say one thing about that? Because you, you brought up, Jim, you brought up working with confidence. Yeah. So there's a lot of psychology and neuroscience behind why this right works. Side. When you're, as a knowledge worker, which all of you are, when you're holding all of these things in your head that you have to do, that cognitive overload is impeding the part of your brain that is essentially your brain's CEO, your prefrontal cortex. When that's stressed, that's not optimized. So you're not going to be able to do the things that your executive functions, you're not gonna have the energy for your executive functions to be optimized, which means you're not gonna be able to think straight. You're not gonna be able to prioritize. You're not gonna be able to make good decisions. That's why we wanna get whatever we have to do out of our head because of what Jim mentioned, that's like Garnick effect, that incomplete tasks will stick around our short-term memory and they'll bug us. They use a Garnick effect a lot in marketing and a lot in, we're all of a certain age. So I believe mm -hmm. all of us grew up with the original Batman. Remember how they would say at the end of a, at the end of an episode, tune in tomorrow, same bat time, same bat station to find out if the Joker does something. And you're like, oh, I, I got to finish that. Or remember the Ginsu knives? You have no need for Ginsu knife, but the moment that they say, but wait, there's more, you're like, I can't change the channel. I got to see what else. Your brain is going to be ruminating. It's so the reason when we're in bed at night, we're not stressed and ruminating over the things we've completed. It's the things that we haven't completed. Okay. I could probably ask all of you what you ate for dinner last night, and you're going to have to like really go into your memory and try and figure that out because you've closed the loop on that. You've pulled that ticket into done, but the stuff that you have not done, that is going to be taking up cognitive cognitive space in your head. That's why we want to get that stuff out of your head. All right, that, lim that, that already frees up capacity out of your head and just follow the two rules of, of personal combat anywhere you are, visualize your work and limit your work and process.
<laughs> give, me, give me time for coffee. <laughs> so this, these two pictures are of two different construction sites in New York City. Uh, and what was so interesting about working in major construction in New York is that every project is a startup. And you wouldn't think that it was, but it's a whole new team coming together to build something that's never been built before, where the design of it is completely evolutionary. You start with a set of plans, but you don't end with that set of plans by any sense of, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and the the uh, team sizes are huge and the money is amazing <laughs> so uh this is this is a group working at the ruth bader ginsburg hospital this is a group working at the columbia business school project uh this is 1.1 billion dollars this is 1.4 billion dollars so just just a little bit of money <laughs> uh floating around here and you can see that they're in rooms that are surrounded by visualizations of their work these are called obeya rooms and those are the rooms where all of the pertinent information for the project lives, right? And so you can see a couple of Kanbans floating around in there. So this one is your stereotypical one, like I just showed you, flowing from left to right, all of the different areas in a value stream, the steps that you take to create value, the tickets flow through that value stream, and you can see what's flowing well, what's in peril, where people need help, et cetera. And you can see that there's multiple people working on these. So there's more than more than three tickets. Um, in this room, you can also see that there's time series data with milestones up here. There's a heat map over here. There's a set of plans on the table. There's a 3D model of the uh, of the of the hospital itself. There's photos of the pilings that had just gone in a couple of days ago. There's safety data over here and it goes all the way around as you can see it even going around you know around the back here. A uh, fairly large room. The most interesting thing, for, well, and there's so many interesting things from this. I read the whole book is about this. <laughs> uh, the collaboration equation book is almost entirely about these people. But, but uh, one of the really cool things about this, and this is how you know you've been successful at something, is that um, general contractors like Turner hire contractors to do contract work. So they hire plumbers, electricians, structural steel people, ornamental metals people, uh, $1.2 billion worth of people to come in and do stuff. Those people are called tradespeople. Tradespeople try as best as they possibly can to never enter this room because this is the principal's office. <laughs> They don't want to come in because this is where the man is and they're going to like they're going to try and like take their budget away or they're going to make them work faster. They're going to do something bad to them. The information in here was so valuable that the tradespeople were whenever they had a meeting like this, they would be lined up outside to come in and look at the room. And when we got the first couple of floors of the parking structure underneath the hospital built, the first thing that we did or the first thing that Turner did was they built the tradespeople their own obeya with a kitchen and lockers. And the um the trade they were like tradespeople who walked in and they like started crying because they they like knew that when it was 115 degrees out on a hot New York morning afternoon, that that room had air con <laughs> and it had water. <laughs> and the and the Turner was like saying we actually care about you and your ability to get your work done and it changed everything about the project it was amazing so then the second project down here this is also a Kanban and it flows from top to bottom right so I was working together with them a week or, so, or like a month before this picture was taken I was working with them and we set up a Kanban that was like I showed you. It flowed from left to right and did all of the stereotypical, you know, Modus, Jim Benson, Tony and Di Maria type of things. And then when I came back, they'd built this. And I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and this one flows from top to bottom. Current state of things are where the post-it notes are. The color of the of the um uh of the magnet 
is um, uh, the color of the magnet is whether or not the it's okay. So all these green ones, they're okay. This yellow, yellow one is kind of in peril. This yellow one over here is kind of in peril. There's no red ones, I don't think, on this particular image. Um, but then they annotated every step. You know, were you what did it happen as it was expected? Did did you you know? And so at the beginning they were just like yes, and they were checking mark stuff off. As they went on, they actually started noting the dates. So you some of these later ones, yeah. Here, uh, I'm trying to find a, a good a good later one. Maybe it's over here. Yeah, over here. In some of the later ones, you can see that they were they were taking all sorts of notes up here about when things were supposed to be done and when they were act actually done. And then they had notes in other systems that said what they had done differently to try and improve the flow of these particular purchases. If you're not understanding what this convoluted image is suggesting, you shouldn't. That's not the point. This is <laughs> this team's visual language. Every team has their own visual language. I know if I see an orange sticky on a wall, that's a problem at MODIS. Mm -hmm. I understand who's doing what work based, based upon certain magnets or certain avatars. That's yep. not the point. The point is that these people have all their information that they need at a glance. So we process visual information much quicker than we do data written information. In the absence of a room like an Obeya, people would be depending on reports and line items and they couldn't surface problems at a glance. You know, if something is wrong, a sticky note on a board that's red will alert people to that anomaly. You know, we don't make, um, we don't, we don't create knowledge out of discrete data. We create knowledge out of patterns. Our brain is a pattern matching machine. So when we see certain tickets moving across the value stream really, really quick, let's say they're all the green tickets, I may know, wow, Dave is on fire this week. He's getting so much done. Or if I see yellow tickets just like kind of gumming up and being the problem in the pen, I may say, wow, you know, those tickets all have a dependency and it's this outside organization. We should stop the line. We should call a meeting and see how all of us together can move those yellow tickets. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to build visual systems that give us as much information at a glance. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> there's there. Uh, uh, we have we have like so many things that we that we could could show you, but uh, I will I will search for that other thing in a second. But I, I do I do want to point this one thing out here, uh, and that's that. Uh, so over here, this is the visualization of their work, and it is in their pattern language. Uh, like like for Dan, I, I would expect that if Dan had an Obeya that was either set up in Miro or in, in this or iObeya or any of the other tools that are out there, that one of those, that the, the, there would be some visualizations that look like this. Like one would be um, uh, a heat map of popular flights booked by origin and destination over time. Uh, and maybe even color coded to certain parts of the year, like uh, at spring break, everybody used to fly to Miami until yeah, Miami yeah. told them all to screw off. <laughs> and now they're all flying to Fort Lauderdale because <laughs> Fort Lauderdale still wants their money, even if they break windows. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and that uh, there would be other other types of heat maps, like heat maps by these types of flights were were impacted when we ran this type of advertising campaign, or when we uh, approached these types of groups, uh, or um, or even like uh, um, I I. Oh come on! I know I can come up with an example. Uh, the the every year there is uh, a a massive gathering of all of the gay choruses from across North America, and we happen to like go after that particular group on this year. This is how that worked by by region. So people in the Pacific Northwest, they were on a plane in no, in no time. People in the Southwest, blah, 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 blah. But the, the visualization needs to speak to the problem that you're trying to solve, not, not to the arbitrary construction of, of how I might set up a Kanban, right? 
So that's the really important thing here is that it's the visualization of work that we're after. And this particular visualization is one that we found is just reasonably universal. Mm -hmm. No matter what you're doing, you have stuff that you haven't done yet, stuff that you're doing and stuff that you've completed. Stuff that you haven't done yet needs to be organized so that you know what the right thing is to do at the right time. Stuff that you have completed needs to be organized into things like, I finished this and it goes really well. And I need to make sure that I talk to everybody else on the team about how it went well. Something right? else at work here. So Jim, you're getting the kinesthetic feedback when you pull that ticket into done. Whee! They've done studies that show <laughs> completion literally feels good to your brain. You get a burst of so serotonin, makes you feel good. But likewise, likewise, you trigger dopamine. And what happens with the dopamine is that you start to optimize for that because dopamine contributes to motivation. And so instead of starting a lot of tasks, now we actually get a reward for completing them. Mm -hmm. Right? So, and the other thing that I wanted to say is um, two, two other real quick things. I'm sure all of you have gone to work you know, been at your desk for 10 hours and then looked at the things you meant to do that day and you felt like you were a big failure. What did I do? Now this gives you a record at the end of your day of seeing where you spent your time, where your effort is actually going. Mm -hmm. And you could scrutinize that at the end of the day and say, you know what, this person is always getting me off track. I am spending way too much time, you know, putting out their fires than getting things that we, we have to get done. The, the last thing I wanted to say real quick is, a lot of people are like, why can't I just, why can't I just have a to-do list? I will likewise venture a guess that if I ask all of you, what happens if you start your day with a to-do list and you do something that is not on that to-do list? <laughs> Has anybody added anything to their to-do list just so you could scratch it off? No. Right? It's because you want that sense of completion. And so now what rather than using it, rather than using that, the, the issue with a to-do list is that you don't see the relationships between the work. You don't see if I pull this type of work, then it opens up opportunities for these other things. Whereas a mechanism like this, you can actually see that. You can see the relationship between the work. So the, uh, oh yeah. So, so when you pull this over and it's complete and you like it, then you have something that you can teach the other people on your team. So that an improvement happens. If you, dang it. If you pull this over and uh, like you do this and it was like particularly painful, you want to discuss that too, because pain is something that you can improve. Like I did this and it was a really awful experience. We've really got to fix this so that anybody who does it in the future is, uh, um, or you pull this thing over and it's something that is just like a milestone. Like we got there. <laughs> so we want to make sure that these things are triggers for discussions because what people will frequently do with their teams is they either will never celebrate or discuss anything that happens. You'll take for granted whether something goes right or goes wrong. You're just like, whatever, I sure I'm glad that's over. <laughs> uh, or you'll wait until you have like a retrospective or a Kaizen event or something to improve things. But if this thing happens and it's awful, you want to talk about it while it's still awful in your head. Because we have a tendency to do something called rosy retrospection, which is like the farther away you get from a traumatic event, the better you remember it. Or the more you <laughs> idealize it. It's the yeah. reason. Yeah. And I could say this, Jim can't. It's the reason women have second babies and not just first. <laughs> right. Because you you need to have the memory of the ordeal yeah. kind of abate. Yep. Um, we, we tell a story about Jim and I worked together years ago with the World Bank and I had to drop out of the project because I discovered that there was six feet of toxic mold in every single room of my house. Within two hours, I had to have a hazmat team come into my home. And it was, I did, after they left, I didn't know where to start. I sat in the middle of my, my living room and cried my eyes out. My home was destroyed. And the way that I tell that story now, Jim's like, you you make that story sound like the Coke machine took your dollar. <laughs> I'm fine telling that story now. That's rosy retrospective. So what we want to do is we want to get a sense. We want to collect metrics, if you will, about how that work made us feel in the moment. And one of the metrics that we use 
is subjective well-being. So when we pull a ticket into done, how did that piece of work make you feel? Were you satisfied with it? Put a smiley face. Kind of ambivalent? Okay, just put a neutral face. Did it upset you? Put an upset face. The reason this is important is if you are running a team and you see your done column is filled with tickets that have unhappy faces, that is a sign that you should stop the proverbial line right there and then because people doing work who are unhappy are going to lend to quality issues. Okay. Ask Boeing. I'm sorry, Dan? Ask Boeing about yes. that. Bingo, yes, <laughs> yes. We don't want to yeah. hide issues. We want to, and the reason that this is a visual control, it should always be radiating because we want to see problems in real time. We don't want a progress report a week after the fact saying that we're having issues with this. You know, especially Sherry, like with, with developing your product, time is of the essence. You've got to get there before the competition does, you know? Can I just say something? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't have, I have a one tiny competitor and these cannot be made 3D. Oh, okay, good. I just thought I'd clear that up. Good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was like, processing, processing. Yeah, oh! Yeah. <laughs> and they don't know. <laughs> You know, there's, there, but I love that you guys ha have given me all of the thoughts that people think. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't mean to interrupt. I, well, so there's, there's one thing that, so before COVID, our, Tony Ann's in my life was literally just wishing that we knew Dan. <laughs> because we were just nonstop on airplanes and every year we touched every continent except for the penguin one. And uh, we would go from like working in construction in New York to putting together shoes in South Africa uh, to running a restaurant in, in Australia. And when we go from place to place, it would be an entirely new business model with entirely new governing constraints. And so one of the things that I have become very, very comfortable with is being willfully wrong about what's going on. So I will shoot my mouth off like you wouldn't believe about what I assume the situation is so that people will will correct me. Because if I don't, I will I will still have made that assumption and then I will have never been corrected. You know, I love that you use the word assumption and Sherry, this is I love that you brought this up. If I were you. I would have been stewing over that for the past hour and eight minutes. <laughs> that would have been bothering me. And what that would have been doing would have been taking up cognitive capacity in my brain. Now, Jim made, made the comment that he makes assumptions. That is exactly why we visualize our work because all of us make assumptions. So before he mentioned value stream map and in the chat, I'm trying to give you all notes just so that you could you don't have to focus on taking notes. So you have them over here. We talk about value stream map. The value stream is visualizing all the steps to your process. Why is this important? Because if I were to ask all of you, give me the steps for making a hamburger. Jim and I are coming to your house. Give me all the steps. I guarantee I would get one, two, three, four. I would get six different ways of making that hamburger. Now, when we're working on a team, we make assumptions that we're all working in the same way. And then, then we have misalignment, we have differences in quality, we're duplicating effort, there's too much churn. So again, visualizing as much of the work as possible so that we don't work off of assumptions is super important. I'm, I'm trying to find the board for, Tony Ann and I have a class, uh, a visual management certification class that is super complicated and so our board for that was also super complicated and i wanted to share it but you I, want to tell me which one i'll go look for it the original one the 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 board where you and i were making all of the units and making sure that all of the the one with the champagne and the frozen people i i i will attempt to look for the board with the champagne and the frozen people okay <laughs> the fro the frozen pony so um, um okay gotcha so yes the uh the um uh the value stream map is the steps that you take to create value we'll talk more about this in the next call actually 
Um, but uh, what happens is, uh, and this has worked for every group I've ever worked with. It's, it's, it's insane how well this works. But if you get a bunch of people together who think that they know what they're doing and you say, okay, right now we're going to work from the end point and working our way backwards, you're going to list every step of what you're doing. You will find that they have very long conversations arguing about what they actually do every single day. And then from there, we say, okay, now where are your problems? What are some solutions? Where do you collaborate with other people? What other groups in the company are you working with? Where could you use more information? Where are their decision-making bottlenecks? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then we build out this system that shows them both how the relation, the human relationships of their work happen and how the actual programmatic workflow happens. And they're both in the same thing. So you marry the humans up with the people with the with the work, and you don't end up with that weird, it's just business bifurcation kind of thing. So what we want to make sure is that the camaraderie that starts at the beginning of your startup, where you've got just a couple of people and everybody knows what's going on, and you're like, let's go change the world, that that keeps going even after you've gotten a couple of series of funding. And you have a bunch of people that you've never met suddenly working for you. Uh, because after, you know, 25 years of constant interaction with startups, I've seen very few startups not do typical stupid startup things. Uh, and I've always meant to write a book just called Stupid Startup Things. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is I, I would I would probably use up all of the remaining rainforests worth of paper just trying to make that gigantic <laughs> gigantic book publishable. Um, so I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to close this up and then maybe we'll jump into to the lean coffee. So um, I we want all of your information in one place so that you can see your work. When you see your work and engage in those types of things that say we have conversations at these times, we note that work is going off the rails at these times, then you can actually engage in learning because you can only learn by understanding the change in something from what it was expected. And what was expected needs to be known by the people who are expecting it. <laughs> and most companies don't actually have that. Because we assume that people are on the same page until one day all hell breaks loose. And then the next thing you know, you've hired Jim and Tony to come in to be your corporate marriage counselors. Jim, right. I found the board. I okay. sent it to you in, in the in the chat. In the oh yeah. in the chat there. Okay. The champagne Ding. glasses are below it. But okay. I did put a uh it's all right. There we go. All right. Um, all right. So this is messy because again, life is messy. Is, but again, I can look at this board at a glance. I don't have to read anything on it. And I know exactly what is happening in my organization just yeah. because of I, I how many tickets are moving, what kind of tickets are moving. Um, okay. Where are the... It's right below. You had it. Go down. You see the champagne glasses, but go down one little... more. Go down, and I think it's okay. the one to the right of that. Okay, that one has little hearts. Well, that's okay. I was. No, I... it's not okay because it's not the story. <laughs> Who changed them? Why did you change them to hearts? I don't because I was uh, now I'm heartbroken. Okay. <laughs> okay, wait. Okay, so there's still one one cold face left. Uh, so uh, in the interim, things have things seem to have gone awry, but. This was a board that Tony Ann and I used to build a very, very complex set of courses called LAVM, uh, Lean Agile Visual Management Program. Jim, show and them the value stream at the top. I'm I'm a doing. I'm a doing. Uh, <laughs> uh, get over there, buddy. Come on, grab it. All right. So what would happen is Jim and Tony would do work and we had to go through an intro write-up, video. Uh, we had some things called the lenses, uh, the the uh, psychology of work, reflections, activities, assignments, downloads, etc. And uh, as things were done, and so the class is done, so that's basically what you're seeing. 
Uh, what you would see is that Tony Ann would say when this stage was done, because she was the last person to touch things. So she was the final, final arbiter of quality. Uh, she would initial those. If I was working on something, there would be a flag in here saying Jim was working on this particular unit, the basics of ESMs. And then you could also see here, I'll just move this over as an example, that like right here, maybe Jim's working on something. Uh, we've got some stuff that Tony Ann has asked him to do. And then this is a, a call to action. So when you zoom out, you can see the oranges and you know you need to zoom in on the orange for a call to action. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this is a very large, complicated project. And when I show you the first visualization, it's like, oh, three things on a, on a board, that's easy. And then you get five people in that board, you're gonna be like, oh my God, I've got so much work. How do I manage that? So the important thing here is these conversations. You know, Tony Ann views the video and then she says, here are the things that you need to go back and edit in that video that you made. And then this is a conversation that we're having. Right. Um, then it goes through the, the stages. Tony Ann's got some notes to herself. And then in the end, she says, you know, that the whole thing's done. And this is her buy off is the, the happy pa face goes into it. And we were going along and I'm so sad that they're gone. But we were going along and one day the happy face is all turned into this face. And they turned into this face. Because Tony was living in a house with no heat in the middle of a horrible cold snap where a lot of the Seattle area had lost power. So she she lost power and she lived at the top of a super high hill like the Grinch, but she didn't have a sleigh. She had a BMW <laughs> <laughs> and the BMW was going to slide down the hill, but it wasn't going to drive. So, so she started marking things as done with these. <laughs> and that's super important because these boards need to display the personality of your team. Because if you lose the people doing the work, then you lose the ability to communicate and control the work. What this is also showing is the level of trust and vulnerability and psychological safety I had with my team. And when I start seeing team members getting silly on a board with that, that shows me that they feel safe. And especially in a startup where I want people challenging the status quo and taking risks, it's the only way you're going to innovate, you need psychological safety on that team. And this is a reflection of the psychological safety on our team that we can be silly with each other. Yeah. So currently I have six students from around the world that are in my LAVM program. And part of the LAVM program, it's very much a meta program. We teach people how to build healthy, humane systems, but first they have to um, self-organize. So part of that is having them self-organize as a team. So we built them an Obeya and I keep popping into the Obeya and I'm starting to see people's personalities come out. And an obey is a really good way. These visualizations are really good ways of fast tracking relationships in a mm -hmm. post lockdown world. All right, we don't have the opportunity to get together with our team members and break bread. I'm Italian. I'm always going to use, you know, demonstrative food metaphors. Um, and how do we get that trust? How do we fast track that sense of trust? And I find that utilizing Obey is letting their personalities shine. I notice I go in there now and I'm like, people are commenting about what movie they saw. You know, the things that we used to do when we would come into the office and, and we, we no longer know what people's dogs' names are, right? So we have to find a way now to humanize the work process when we're not actually able to physically engage with humans. The... This incidentally was the first visualization of the uh, of the Latham project. Yeah. Uh, it, totally devoid of personality. Uh, yes, devoid of chaos. 
but I don't want to work from a spreadsheet because a spreadsheet is not going to surface the information that no. I need. It's no. not going to tell me at a glance. I can't tell no. how much of this has been accomplished if it's in a spreadsheet. No. The visualization Jim showed you with the smiley faces, no. if I just sit back and I see all of those tickets aligned on the right hand side, I know how much of the work was done no. here. This gives me this gives me no feedback. And speaking of Guy Smiley, yeah. hey, John, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Sadly, uh, Europe and the United States do not use the same time zone mechanisms. And so we had a little bit of an overlap there. Not not at the moment. Uh, we're, we'll catch up with them fairly soon. <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, they'll okay. catch up with us here next week. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, I meant by getting rid of daylight savings time. Um, um, that would be nice. So um, just to let you all know, that one very large vertical board that I showed you, this was the original board. So that team took their personality and their needs and turned it into that very large vert vertical board. Um, and one of the most important stories, I think, for us about that is... Um, Tony Ann and I had a project in um, West Virginia. And when we started that project, um, the sea level people took us out for coffee two cities away from the city where the company was located because they wanted to make sure no one was there. <laughs> it, but it was also the closest coffee shop. <laughs> Because this company was like literally in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia. Um, but the first thing that they said to us was, we have to tell you, we have to warn you that this is West Virginia and we don't have the best and brightest. And we saw some of the most amazing things there. But one of them was we set up a board with one of their teams. And the team had, uh, the team was had, was had very low morale. They were very upset because their product had a lot of bugs in it and they were constantly scrambling to fix those bugs and they always felt under under fire and they were constantly answering for their for their actions and whatnot. And um, <laughs> so we leave and they had a board and let's just say that this was their board, but then they annotated all of the tickets by level of severity. And so like one of the ticket levels of severity that they had was like this picture of a screaming cat. <laughs> and then they had like a mushroom cloud and then they had like a giant shark and they had all of these like other crazy things that ultimately meant nothing except that they were taking the time to share in the pain of their own predicament in a healthy way. And so that's one of the things that, that you know, if you can set up visualizations, so this is what uh, the, the warning here is, don't go out and get Asana because Asana is not going to let you personalize that board. It might give you quote unquote better statistics, but the best metric is do people actually want to use the board? And that metric is always gonna be no. <laughs> If, it, if it's a boring board that's painful to use. So you want, you want the people, you know, to come and to own the work that they're doing. Um, and uh, I'm looking really quickly for an image of, uh, uh, that I want from a, um, From one of our events, but uh, there's a, there's an understanding of why why we come to work that is greatly undervalued in startups, which should value it the most of all, because the people who are there are buying into a vision. And then that vision ends up getting muddied quickly by stress and frustration and, you know, fear. Um, so this picture is on the other side of that wall from that room at the, uh, at the Ruth Bader Ginsburg hospital. And this is their, this is their team Kanban. Once again, 
it is wrong. <laughs> this Kanban is wrong. And it's wrong because it is going by day of the week and not by the flow of work. Well, it's what this group needs. Because on the other side, this is Paul. And if you were, turn the camera where Paul is looking, the entire team that's working on this project on the Turner side is standing up in their daily huddle. And it is 54 people. 54 people having an active meeting. So what these are is these are the major meetings that are happening on each day. And who is going to be out of pocket because of those meetings, right? And over here, these things are deadlines that need to be satisfied on these days. So in, in Agile, they try so hard to deny the fact that, are, that you need deadlines. Well, humans need them. Because without them, we will, we'll procrastinate, we'll, we'll rationalize procrastination and all the hell and gone. So what this group does every day is they figure out who's going to be around over the next couple of days. And then they start to prioritize their work based on who they need to collaborate with and who they're going to be around. The cost savings for this in this hospital cannot be underestimated. Easily millions of dollars of cost savings of not foregoing work because you didn't know somebody wasn't going to be around. Right? Um, then down here, they have the done stuff. They have things that they want to push to the next week. Um, uh, they have uh, things that they need to get back to, to the uh, Institute of Health. And then here, you know, they've got the like the little baseball cards they made of their team. Uh, and over here, then they've got other calendars that are showing other things that are coming up. Uh, over here, you, they've got you, other you visual have, controls. You have to. Uh, you're going out of bounds a little bit with the it, mouse. It, it it matters not, <laughs> um, uh, but that's that's as close as we're going to get. Uh, so. One of, one of the things I want to say about this is what this is causing, or I should say, what this is preventing, is the need for. Hey Martha, where are we at with this project? Or can somebody generate a report so I could see what was completed last week? Status meetings now meetings could become working sessions. Right, because people already have all the knowledge that they need at a glance. So we once worked with an organization who played a PhD, one of the highest salaries in the organization, to do one thing. He generated a status report and analyzed it every week. And it became this political document. It was a joke. It was this thick. And he said, every week we generate these, we print these, and they go in people's drawer. Nobody uses them. But they were a political requirement. They had to have some type of touch you know, touch point for status. But status a week later is not going to help you correct problems in real time. This gives you a lot more agility to respond to needs and the needs of the people doing the work. Can I ask a couple questions? Absolutely, Dan. Um, first of all, this looks like it only works with your team in one physical location. So if we started off with a uh, remote workforce or some of the key executives in our startup, uh, this wouldn't work, right? Correct. This team, or, this or team you here, have a software version. The, the, uh, this is a software version right here. Uh, so we're this distributed. Team, we're yeah, Jim and I. Jim and I live twenty five minutes apart. Jim doesn't believe in traveling over a bridge to see me because I live well, in. Tony Ann doesn't believe that either. So, so our, 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 we do not have a physical obeya. We have an online obeya. Gotcha. But, yeah. but, but not only that, but, uh, Thushantan's in Vancouver, Dave yeah. Pryor is in New York City. York. Uh, uh, Mark Kilby yeah. is in Atlanta. Florida. Uh, we have people all around the world. Uh, and, um, uh, in, in fact, like, like Lynn Kelly, in the next in two weeks, I will meet up with her in Ohio because we're both teaching at the same conference. But it will be the first time I've actually met her face to face. Um, so uh, no, all of this stuff, and in fact, uh, the book that Martha held up at the beginning, Tony Ann and I wrote that with visual controls in two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten, um, entirely distributed. She was in Washington D.C. and I was in Seattle. 
But something wow. really amazing happened during that process that I want to share really quick. Um, every morning we would jump onto Skype. We had a rudimentary online Kanban, so we knew exactly what chapter, who was working on, you know, what components we needed to add to that chapter. And we likewise were working tandem in a Google Doc, a shared Google Doc. And at one point, now I was in Washington, D.C., Jim was in Seattle, so three hour difference. At one point, Jim said to me, sweetheart, don't you have to get up and make dinner? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, and I looked at the clock and it was eight o'clock at night. Because I had all the information that I needed, I never had to go looking for anything. I was able to, to achieve the elusive sense of flow. You know, that sense of that cognitive sense of ease where we just lose our ego, we fall away from ourselves, and we're so deep into the work that nothing distracts us. Mm -hmm. There's a great book that was written by Cal Newport called Deep Work. I cannot recommend it a lot uh, enough. It is not hyperbole when it's when I share it, it changed my life. Um, and it talks about how we no longer are able to go deep because we're so, our attention is so fractured. We're so distracted. And so we don't accomplish what we really could. We likewise mm -hmm. don't think at a level that we really could. And so visualizations like this have helped me achieve a sense of flow. And going back to the, the beneficial constraint that Jim talks about, about giving yourself only three things to do, um, that likewise prevents us from multitasking or task switching. Because we're yeah, only I focused like that, on me. that point. Um, because I found for exactly that reason, I find myself lumping together everything. This is everything I've got that, yeah. that's in flight. Yes. Um, and that that makes perfect sense. I'm also mm -hmm. kind of geeking out in a good way because my undergraduate degree is in research and experimental psychology. So <laughs> anytime you want to talk, Dan, that's I <laughs> love that. <laughs> One yes. other quick question. Um, I worked in a um, with a group of software developers that used Agile, yep. and I can't remember that it just left my brain. But does this system operate with, and I can't remember the name, like a dungeon master? A scrum, so like a scrum master. master? Scrum master. <laughs> um, I I I just I just want to leave it dungeon master and leave it at that. So, <laughs> So um, uh, I have been involved in Agile since before it had a name. Uh, my software company was founded uh, using a pre pre press book of one of the very early Agile texts by a guy named Kent Beck. Um, what I can tell you is this: is that uh, um, the issue with Agile is that it has become a religion, and it has very very set tenets. Things that you will do, you will adhere to two week iterations, you will use story points, you will have uh, a certain format for your stand up meetings. And that when that happens, you end up using someone else's process to do your team's work. So the thing to take from Agile is the lesson that uh, we need to avoid large batches and ensure that we have regular touch points and frequent touch points with our customers. But I, I'll tell you a quick recent Agile story that, that dovetails with my first realization that Agile didn't quite work. And that was that I had a client uh, just recently who had hired a software company for hire to build something for him. And he was repeatedly telling them that he didn't have clarity into what they were building. And he was losing confidence in their ability to finish. And they kept coming back and saying, we've got everything planned out in two week sprints. We're going to give you a demo every two weeks. And he would come back the next day and he would say, I don't know what you're doing. And they're saying, it's okay. I'm in two, I've got two week sprints. So years and years and years and years ago, I was working uh, at my software company, Gray Hill Solutions, uh, in the, it, based in the U District. We had a project for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in San Francisco, or in Oakland, actually. And we were building an online um, real-time traffic website that used GIS to, um, to show you a map of traffic. So if you've used Google, Google Maps, uh, I'm its grandpa. And uh, so we were building this site. And at one point, 
the client calls up and just starts freaking out on us because we haven't delivered yet. And we just talked to them a few days beforehand. And we had planned out what was going to happen over the next sprint. So the next two weeks, we were planning that out. And they were they were just bouncing off the walls and we couldn't get a word in edgewise. And finally, at the end, we're like, look, you guys, that's right. all you're asking for has been planned. And we agreed that it was going to be delivered next Friday. You know, we're working on it and it's going to get done. And then they're like, OK, well, whatever. And then they hang up and they're still mad. And I'm like, oh, my God, that was awful. So we called up. Uh, this guy named David Carey. And we said, David, that was terrible. I don't ever want to live through that again. And the whole reason that we're doing Agile, so that never happens to us. And he's like, look, you guys, you just need to get credit for what you're already doing. And so then we hung up the phone. We said, okay. And then we hung up the phone and we're like, but we're Agile. Agile already does this. And what we didn't realize was that the need what happened to our hosts? Oh. <laughs> I scared our hosts away. <laughs> That's unprecedented. <laughs> um, so we said to them, look, guys, uh, we, we were sitting there going, like, this is how it's supposed to work. And then I went home and I went to bed and I woke up in the middle of the night going, oh, my God, I'm the jerk. And the thing is, is that thinking that our adoption of agile was going to fix all of the problems was like saying that agile was going to fix our marriage the the it's like it's like when somebody says i don't feel like you're communicating well enough and you say yes i am you know <laughs> if they say it then something isn't being communicated and maybe they're not hearing it and you're trying to communicate it well enough but it's not getting through and so i'm like we have to we have to communicate with them at the speed at which they need to be communicated with. And that is how Kanban was born. We visualized the work in a spreadsheet and shared that spreadsheet with them via FTP. <laughs> Uh, because nothing was built that would allow us to do this like like that. Um, but but we let them see on a day-to-day -day basis everything that was happening. And then we started to report back to them every other day. And we opened up the server for them and we started doing real-time builds of the system. So like this is in 2004, we were doing real-time release of our product for an enterprise scale system because that was the level of communication that needed to happen in order for the people not to freak out. And they were freaking out because they had budgeted. This is a true story. This isn't me like tooting my own horn. They came to us originally and said, how much would you charge us for doing this? And we said $250,000. And they're like, there's no way you could do this for $250,000. And we're like, yes way. And they're like, no way. And we're like, yes way. And then they're like, well, all of these other guys are coming in at a million and a half. So you're, you're crazy. So they go off and they hire the people for a million and a half dollars. Those people spend 1.25 million of their dollars, giving them nothing. And then they come to us and they said, uh, remember when you said, <laughs> And then we build it to them for them for $250,000 because software development usually happens in an incredibly haphazard way. Mm -hmm. um, but the only way that we did that was we just, we just made sure that we never had to report anything to them after that point. So the faster your team internally can communicate these things to each other. So right now I know exactly what Mark and Dave are doing. I know what Thushanthan and Dave Pryor and uh, and um, uh, uh, Brian are doing um, because I can just see it right here on the on the thing. I don't have to write them. I don't have to ask them. I don't have to do anything. They're also, there. Also, if in the absence of a board like this, if I'm not hearing from Jim, I could be thinking, "Oh, he's just screwing around." But now I see this board, and I see his head is a red. He's overextended. So I actually see the capacity that my people are working at yeah. and I can intervene when I feel that they're taking on too much work. 
Um, one of the other things that I points that I, I, I can't, I can't say this strongly enough. When you don't have transparency into the work, whether you don't have transparency into what your team is doing, your team doesn't have transparency into what they're supposed to be doing, you have a lack of clarity, you have a lack of certainty. And we know that a lack of clarity or a lack of certainty triggers a threat response in the brain. And that likewise is going to impede your prefrontal cortex, your brain CEO, all of your executive functions. You're not going to be optimized for good decision-making, problem-solving, prioritization. So, this is a very humane way of working, visualizing your work is, I, I always go back to that. If we want to treat our, our, our people well, give them the information that they need. Don't, don't hide it from them. Right. I also like that feedback yeah. um, with the smiley faces yeah. or the happy oh, yeah. faces. Subjective well-being, yes. Yeah. yeah. That, it, te that it keeps... tells me if somebody, is, if somebody is upset with their work, again, why are they upset with their work? And if they continue to work like that, quality issue right there. Yep. So I also want to note that in here are also the workshops that we do internally to like build out how we're selling things, uh, to build out what our what our marketing plan is going to be, uh, to build out what our release is. Uh, up here are sets of questions that we have for the sauce provider that is providing the major platform for our school. And we keep these things up there with you know, not only questions, but also with these. And then we meet with our representative from them uh, every other week. And we discuss these things. Some of the things we'll write off for an email, but most of the things we save for discussions. And we save them for discussions because those lead to deeper conversations. Uh, but you can see here that uh, there's all sorts of humane things here. So just one thing that I notice here in this one is that... Uh, uh, this guy here is uh, Dave Brules. <laughs> uh, Dave Brules uh, was a Seattleite. Uh, he passed away last year. He is the father of my good friend, John Brules. Uh, so if you ever see me at a concert in Seattle, you'll probably see me with John Brules. But this is his dad. His dad invented the Kmart Blue Light Special <laughs> uh, when they were living in Minnesota. Um, but... Uh, um that that we bring those human things into the conversations that that we're doing because humans are the things that are actually doing the work so this does look like a mess but what we know as a group is that the important thing is that operations happens up here in the upper upper left and that everything else is down here and there's a search function and so we can just type in funnel or collaborate walkie or style guide or whatever it is that we're looking for. And it will take us right to that data. The other thing that's nice about this, and I don't have a good example. Well, there's a good example of it. Uh, this is of a meeting, but we'll just use it as an example is that you'll find that we often have tickets in here that just have links. And those links will either be to videos that we've made explaining something or to maybe confluence, which has documentation in it or things like that. So that this, this online OBEA ha is also our knowledge management tool. Um, so if something's going wrong with something, uh, I can put it here. Uh, I can note over here that I want to discuss it. Um, so like uh, th th uh, there's a... Uh, Mark made a calendar video up here, but the point of that is that uh, rather than having a big discussion with us about how something worked, Mark made a video about it and then uh, made a link that was clickable so that you could get to it from the system. And then people just clicked on the link and they went to it. So again, these are the vi these are the things that we need visualized, and it's everything from you know your marketing plan all the way down to you know what the color palette is and the layout is for for things that you're releasing. Um, and the same thing was true at the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Hospital. On one of the walls was nothing but flooring samples, right? Uh, 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 in, in the one outside, there was a huge area that was um, samples of uh, the different types of uh, HVAC systems that were going in. Jim, I just put in the chat a link to the Accred's board. 
I don't know if that would be helpful, especially to show how a new team comes together. This okay. team is less than a month old. They are, um, they couldn't be more distributed. They're on several continents. They have their time zones. They have what I really appreciated over to the left, Jim, is they have their modus metro. Some people join this cohort earlier than the others. And so they've already worked through the material over the, so they put where, actually it's easier on the, if you go to the left, I think it'll be easier for them. Yeah, they put who's where. And what was really interesting to notice, Jeffrey, who has been in the program longer, said, I'm further along, but I'm going to hold, I'm going to stay back to see if anybody needs help. Yeah. So, so, so earlier, team. all of these, all brand these new team, less here. than a month old. But because of this visualization, you know, it's not like they're not exchanging emails. They're not having meetings to talk about status. They're actually having working sessions now to take the course together, to share learnings with each other, to share real life applications of the material that we're teaching. But this has been a really beautiful board that they put together. And essentially um, that center where it says humans getting to know each other to the right gym, it's the board that Lori put up there. This is, remember I was talking about fast tracking, yeah building trust on a team they just put this up they put the members of the team and just some things about them and the conversations that they're able to have in this has just been remarkable and these are people who probably before they complete this this uh certification will never be in the same room together the the interesting thing about this particular class is that uh, Pete, when people are in active cohorts, uh, the the work is incredibly intense. This is not a this is not a two day sit and get kind of thing, and it's also not part of the offer for this group. <laughs> the offer for this is 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 the is the easier stuff. But the nice thing about this is that because these people do end up working together, collaborating together, visualizing their work together they end up forming bonds. And so from our first couple of cohorts, people have literally flown to Europe to meet other people that were in their cohort. So like, they, like they've literally flown to Spain, you know, to hang out and eat dinner with the people that they studied with. So it, it does, so the work does get that intense and uh, they're not too good yet at, at laying it out, but they're not too bad. Um, they, at least they've got headings. Um, but you also, can see also over to the if you move the board yep. over to the right gym yeah um they have artifacts from all of our calls so we didn't get the chance to use it during this during this session but we use this thing called lean coffee which is a democratized way of applying kanban to a meeting so basically all of you we would have all of you put questions on this kanban you would vote on what's most important to all of you. We would prioritize those, would set a timer for 10, 15, 20 minutes and have a conversation about the things you all are most interested in. You all are the arbiters of value for this talk. And so that's how we, that's how we format our, our meetings, our working sessions. Um, and what we tell people is the exchange of information is not, or I should say the documentation of information is not what these meetings are, are about the creation of knowledge and of next steps and of action items is always what we want to surface from these meetings. Yeah. So, so in, in a lean coffee, um, let me make this wider. Come on, grab it. There you go. Good boy. All right. Um, I have a board set up for this team. If you wanted to use that, Jim, if well, not. we've only got 10 minutes left. So I just okay. wanted to show something that was, that was done. Uh, but the other day we got together, they generated a bunch of topics um, uh, and uh, we we talked about them. Uh, but you can see here, unfortunately, I grabbed one where it's just all me writing it down. But meetings have a product and that product is understanding and knowledge and actions for the future. And so if you leave a meeting, even if you write down the action items on a piece of paper and leave, uh, that's not enough. So in a lean coffee, people come in and they set the topics. And then as you're going through and learning, you write down um, what people are learn learning, what they're talking about. Then everybody remembers and sees the value to other people. 
and so in the next call, we will actually get around to doing the lean coffee and that will, uh, that, that will work better. But yeah, we, there, those lean coffees are there. So we do have Jim, 10 I want minutes. I to point so out the time, Jim, that there it's 10 minutes. <laughs> Jinx. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so, um, so this is what I want to show you is that back here on the original bit, uh, there were these scans, there's this link and, and, uh, John will send out the link to everybody, but what we've done at Modus Institute, because we're so nice, is we've set up a page just for this group, right? And um, oh, there's basically everything on the site except for the giant thing is 60% off. But these are the classes around going that go deep around what we talked about today. These are the classes for next week, and then these are the classes for the week after. Uh, classes are classes and that's great. But what's really the cool thing about, about Modus Institute is that there's like hundreds of people from around the world smashed in there, all learning about this stuff together and then discussing about what it means to them and how they're deploying it and how they're frustrated by not being able to deploy it and all of those good things. So we end up building kind of this interesting not just community of practice, but almost like support network of people who are actually interested in getting work done in a humane and fun way uh, that uh, that are actively there to, you know, not just say, I, I, I don't want work to hurt me anymore, but it's like, I want to do work as a real professional and enjoy it while I'm doing it. Um, so this is on the Modus Institute site, modusinstitute.com and uh, slash Seattle Angels. Um, but today we talked about the value stream mapping. We talked about personal Kanban. We talked about prioritization. And so those are the things that are up there now. Uh, we also talked specifically about Obeyas. Uh, we'll talk more about them next time in a more organized way. Uh, but the goal with the next call is to talk about kind of that planning aspect. How do we get together as a group, whether we're a group of one, two, or 150, uh, and plan together so that no one is forcing their uninformed will on other people? So what generally happens is the more people that are excluded from the planning process, the more information and perspective is excluded from the planning process. Also, it is a lack of agency that you're giving your people. And just like a lack of clarity, we know that a lack of agency also triggers a threat and a fear response in people. They impeding, go hand in hand. Yeah. In, impeding your, your brain CEO, so to speak. Oh. Does anybody have any questions? Dan. You're muted, Dan. Random question, Ob Obeya. Uh, what language is that from? Japanese, Jap great room. Japanese, okay, yep. thank you. Yep. So so Kinevin, what we talked about earlier. So Kinevin is is a random uh, uh, um, Welsh. Welsh word uh, because Dave Snowden is Welsh and he was tired of all of the all of the new business words being arbitrary Japanese words. And so he wanted an esoteric Welsh word instead. <laughs> um but it was, uh, it was popularized at toyota when they were building the prius it was a way of making sure that decision making wasn't just coming from the boardroom so they were moving the decision making the, they were giving people clarity who were actually on the on the floor on the shop floor yep. creating this so they were the ones who would know if there was a defect they so that's there's a good story about that from i can um i can see if i can get you a link for that. Yeah. That's where that whole idea of pushing the button, the big red button on the was, assembly. Was yeah. Toyota in the post-war era, correct? Yeah, yeah. so that, the, yeah, the, so the Andon Cord came way before the, the Obeya, but uh, the, the, yeah, the, one of the most interesting things that I saw from an Obeya was when I was working with uh, the GE large appliance division in, um, in Louisville, Kentucky. And when you go there, um, it really does feel like you're in a World War II military base. 
these huge imposing buildings separated by giant, giant, ugly lawns, not well tended, like just ugly, like ugly. And you go there and you're like, this feels like a minimum security prison. And uh, so you would go through each building and each building had its own CEO. So dishwashers, washing machines, dryers, they all had their each had their own focus and their own CEO. And each building had its own culture. And plant five was the did the um, the French door bottom drawer fridges. Very, very popular. I'd imagine that at least at least one other person than I has one on this call. And um, they uh, that had a great um, culture and they also had an obeya. And so I go into the obeya and they called it the blue room because it was blue and it was huge. It was a huge room and it had stuff over all over all the walls. And it was like spreadsheets, like really tiny stuff that you had to walk up and scrutinize. And um, I'm in there and I'm watching assembly people from the floor coming in on their breaks to like read about shipping data and they're reading about defect data and they're reading about return rates and these are people like on the floor who if you went to plant four or plant three they they could not care less they're like give me my money and let me go home and they were they these people cared because they had the information to care about and it, it it came about that like I really realized that something special was going on there when I was uh, I was you know doing my rounds walking around the place, and um, I'm waiting for my colleagues and standing by this break area and this break area is right next to this woman and she's working and she's pulling. Uh, wiring harnesses out of this box, dropping them into the back of the fridge, turning the first two bolts, and then the fridge goes on. And she's working away, and she's working away, and it looks okay to me. And this guy comes walking up, and there's like this this um, bridge that he comes over and, uh, and comes from one side of the assembly line to the other and comes down where she is at. And he looks at her, and he just keeps looking. And then he walks over and he says, are you okay? And she mumbles something. And he says, look, I was going to go on break, but you go on my break and I'm going to do your work for 15 minutes and you go put your head down and rest. So she walks by me and like collapses on the table, works for about 15 minutes. And then she gets up and goes back to work. Thanks the guy. And then he goes back and works and never takes his break. He did that in a union shop not being a shop steward, not being anything. Nobody came to say, what the hell are you doing? He did it because he cared and the plant had enough of a culture that would allow him to do that. And I guarantee you in those other plants that wouldn't have happened. That's what we want to bring about, whether people are co-located, whether they're distributed, whether they're in the same city, the same state, the same hemisphere, don't care. We want people to, to take Vonnegut's advice and God damn it, be kind. And when we do that, people work harder, stuff gets done faster, you make your deadlines and you do it because people aren't afraid. And the only way you can do that is to have that blue room that says, I respect you enough to share this information with you. That's that's what we're on about. <laughs> And I did it before two o'clock. <laughs> I got to give a whole sermon and ended before keeping people too late. I'm yeah. I'm Thank feeling you. like a deliverer of value now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony Ann and Jim, <laughs> for your time and your wisdom. And I'm going to say what's on Tony Ann's LinkedIn because I really like it. She is a humanizer of work, <laughs> which is what she's been talking about all day today in mm -hmm. terms of giving the information. Overwhelms people can't be kind. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have that capacity. Something has yeah. to give. So let's get rid of the overwhelm. Let's give them what they need to feel good about their job, to feel good about their project, and let's thrive together. Mm -hmm. And, and to so put much. up... 
pin on this. Thank you so much. Um, the, the, we have a collection of workshops that we're doing. This is not just one, but there's three here in this series, but we have other ones that are coming. So now that you're signed up here, you can go look at the Seattle Angel Meetup group. And we put these recordings on the Seattle Angel Conference YouTube channel if you want to see the other things that we've done. So please feel free to drop us a note and let us know about any of the things you'd like to learn more about. And uh, there's definitely some opportunities for us to dive deeper into how to be effective with Kanban just on personal level, let alone a team level. So yep. thank you, uh, Jim and Tony Ann. Really grateful to have you here. Thank you. A, a good, Look a good forward way to continuing to the, the conversation, day. everyone. The YouTube channel is in the chat if you want to pick that up. Okay. The information was really great. Um, I, I super loved it. Uh, I work like that every day. I'm a project manager for our firm. <laughs> uh -huh. And my other project, you know, is is the uh, bag washer, but it's it's really interesting. <laughs> great, great information. Yeah, very, very good. Thank you. Awesome. Noel, were you able to see things? Did you did you get the the screen so you're able to see things? I was sending him copies of the screens. I okay. <laughs> so I don't Alrighty. know. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And hopefully we'll see you next time. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to that. And next time we will do the lean coffee. So it'll be a little bit more two-way. Good. All right. Great. Thank you, you. Thank you all so much. All right. Bye-bye.